All right, good morning, gentlemen. How are we doing this fine Monday morning? Good, bad, ugly? Uh, can you guys hear me on the stream okay? Hopefully. All right, well, so let's uh, let's pick up where we left off. So, um, <clears throat> the last time uh, we were talking about uh, optimization, and uh, so let's just kind of run back through the problem that we were working on, which was we have 100 meters of fence, and we wanted to build a rectangular garden. Um, and uh, the idea was we wanted to maximize the area of the uh, the garden that we build. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of ways that we could theoretically do that, um, assuming that we have a rectangle. Uh, we could have sort of long and skinny or square or somewhere, you know, sort of in between. Um, but we don't know exactly what shape uh, will we'll do the job. So we uh, we figured out, okay, if we call the rectangle that we're going to build x by y, then uh, the area that we want to optimize is x times y, and the perimeter, which is sort of our limitation, we don't have infinitely much fence, is 2x plus 2y. Um, and uh, then what we wanted to do was, was optimize. So, um, the problem that we ran into is that the area or the optimization function, um, uh, the thing that we wanted to optimize, the area, was two variables. And we don't know how to deal with a two variable optimization. Um, and so we want to sort of transform that into one variable problem. Uh, and we were able to do that because we had the assumption that our um, value for uh, uh, the x and y had to, to add up basically to 50 um, because the perimeter of the whole thing was 100. Um, so once we knew that, we could replace y with uh, what its relationship with x was. Uh, we could have replaced x with y, didn't really matter. Um, and so we got that our objective function was this, 50 minus x squared, and that's the thing we want to optimize. Now, because it's a single variable problem, we can throw the calculus at it, and uh, then we got, uh, took the derivative, set it equal to zero, solved for x, and got our critical value. Um, and so we, our conclusion, at least as of last time, was that the garden of maximum area is 25 meters by 25 meters. Okay, but this uh, this begs the question, how do we know that we haven't been duped? So how do we know that we really have actually maximized and optimized the area? Um, and so for that, let me go to a new page. Um, let's actually interrogate the assumptions here a little bit more. So let me redraw kind of our fence. And... Um, we said that 2x plus 2y had to equal 100. But in reality, we really were dealing with this situation. Um, namely, that we have 100 meters of fence to use, but we don't actually have to use all of it or, for that matter, we don't even have to use any of it. Um, now, that might sound like a silly uh, thing to, to mention, um, that it, it perhaps is uh, common sense, let's say it this way, that it's not going to, we're not going to maximize the area unless we use all the fence that's available to us. Okay, but from a strictly mathematical standpoint, there's no assumption that we have to use all of the fence available. And so what would happen if we didn't? Okay, so our constraint 
really was an inequality rather than an equality. Um, and so that makes things a little bit more entertaining than perhaps we originally thought. Um, and if we think about what this means for a second, um, first, oops, the values of x and y individually have to be bigger than or equal to zero, and that makes sense because they represent a distance. So it doesn't make, um, it's not reasonable to talk about negative distances. So um, it's got to be that. Um, and the second is that the two of them together oops, have to add up to um, less than or equal to 50 um, because twice uh, because of the perimeter equation here, um, just basically dividing both sides by 2. And so what that means is that at most, If we let x equal 0, then um, then y would have to be between 0 and 50. And similarly, if y equals 0, then x also has to be between 0 and 50. And uh, that makes sense. These would be sort of extreme cases of fencing where if we let x equals 0, our fence would basically look like this. We would have 50 meters um, down and 50 meters back up. And basically, we just have a fence standing in the middle of nowhere. And that doesn't enclose any area. And then the other situation is sort of the same idea, but it would be kind of like this. Okay, so these are the extremes at the other end, and uh, perhaps you could sort of guess, and uh, so let's call this common sense, these situations minimize the area. Now we wanted to maximize, so these aren't the droids we're looking for, um, but we should still consider them. Okay, so um, let's also look at this. Um, one of the equations that we had, so let's go back to last time, we had this function was our area function, okay? So 50x minus x squared. That's what we got after we eliminated a variable um, in order to make this thing a single variable problem. We also now know that the range of x's that we care about is between 0 and 50. So Let's actually just graph this thing, and I'm going to switch the stream over to Mathematica. All right, so I'm going to define my function on 0 to 50. Okay, and it shouldn't be too much of a shock what this looks like. We've got ourselves a nice parabola. Um, and um, what we want to know is where are the optimal points for this thing? Well, um, clearly we can't have area smaller than zero. And uh, we've just sort of found where the, the uh, minimum areas occur. They occur when you allocate all of the fence to one direction and none to the other, and that would be at x equals 0 or x equals 50. x equals 0, of course, would correspond to y equals 50 and vice versa, okay? And then um, 
the point that we found earlier, the place where the derivative was 0, so this is what we found last time, occurred at x equals 25, and so that would be our maximum up there at the top of the parabola, um, x equals 25, and then uh, the area would be that squared, which happens to be 625, but okay, great. Um, okay, so what this illustrates is that um, endpoints are important. Um, namely, that optimum, optimal, um, values could occur at an endpoint or on the interior um, at a critical point. Okay, now, not every optimization problem uh, takes place on a closed interval. So here, um, our optimization problem uh, for x and y, the values of x or y, sort of vice versa, um, had to range over a closed interval starting at 0 and ending at, in this case, 50. Not every problem is necessarily going to be like that, where uh, the optimums, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to switch back to the screen here. Um, not every um, not every problem that uh, that we look at will um, will have um, will be over a closed interval like this. Some it might be the case that x has to be say. Uh, bigger than or equal to zero, but there's no limit on how big x could be. Um, and so if we're in a situation like that, we have to be a, even more careful and use tools like the second derivative test or first derivative test to kind of uh, figure out what's going on. So, um, okay, so that, that should put that particular um, problem to bed. Um, any questions so far? Let me get a shout out in the... Um, um, in the uh, text chat on Discord or, uh, or voice chat on Discord or the uh, stream chat here on, on Twitch. Question, preguntas, fragen. All right, Willie, you're good. Nate, you're good. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's move on to another a uh, little bit spicier problem, um, and this one will illustrate um, that uh, what happens when x could kind of basically be anything. Um, so let me um, let's sort of draw the situ oops draw the situation here. So <laughs> let's suppose that we've got um, a shoreline, and at one point we have a um, a facility of some sort, and then on the uh, another spot. And sorry, there goes the dog. Uh, we've got some other facility that's offshore. Okay, and so we want to connect these two things with a um, uh, with a power line, say. Okay, and let's say that the distance between them is 5,000 meters, and the distance offshore here is 1,000 meters. Okay, and we'll call this point A and point B, and so we want to connect. A to B. All right, now, if uh, what do we want to optimize here? If we wanted to optimize the distance, then 
then we would just use a straight line. But this would be no fun if that's all we were trying to do here. And so here's sort of the idea um, on a problem like this. Um, it maybe makes sense if I'm trying to take a power line from point A to point B that it would cost me more money to uh, bury a cable per foot underwater than it would uh, along the shoreline. And so maybe what we want to do is we want to come some distance away um, from the power or from the point A and we want to go not a straight line but we want to go some amount this way along the shore and then some amount that way. Okay, so let's sort of sketch the extreme uh, kind of uh, situations. We could have A, B. We could, for example, do a straight line. We could, for example, do um, go along the shore and then go at a right angle to uh, that to the other point or we could sort of go like I drew originally sort of a little bit along the shore and then once we reach some point then do a straight line to the um, uh, to the uh, offshore point and we could even do something really silly um, which would be to go um, way past the facility and then go backwards. Okay, like that. Now, as you can probably guess, uh, this lattermost um, situation that I drew would be rather stupid, um, but there's no mathematical reason to say that I couldn't do that. It's just common sense says that it's probably not going to be a good idea. Um, okay, so um, let's take the picture here. And I'm going to copy this over to the next page. Um, and so, and then of course give the actual rest of the problem. So, the problem is that um, that the land cost and the water cost are different. Um, the land cost is 50 bucks a meter and the water cost is 130 bucks per meter. Okay, so clearly we want to use as little water cost or as little water cable as is absolutely necessary um, in order to, um, uh, to do this. Um, but we are going to have to use at minimum a thousand meters of cabling under the water because that's the distance from the the point B to the shore. Um, maybe we'll use a little bit more than that. Maybe we'll use um, a lot more than that. But at bare minimum, uh, it can't be any less than a thousand. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of this distance here as x. And then uh, that's going to be the distance basically from the point on the shore sort of directly uh, closest to B. Um, and the, then the remaining distance here would be 50 miles, or sorry, not 50, but 5,000. Um, it was 50 in the last problem would be 5,000 minus x. Now, I could have labeled the red part x and then the other part would have been 5,000 minus x. It really doesn't matter, but um, hopefully you guys will notice in just a moment that um, the this particular choice of where to put x uh, will simplify the algebra slightly later and so it will, um, it will pay off. Okay, so the land distance is 5,000 minus x. But the water distance 
this is the fun one. The water distance is the blue line in my diagram, and that's not just x. It's actually that, right? So that's just Pythagoras' theorem to get the uh, length of the blue segment in terms of its legs. Um, okay, so any questions or issues up until now? Um, all right, so Willie, yeah, does it make sense that there's at least a thousand meters of underwater cable? Sorry, I didn't see that uh, chat message until just now. Are we Gucci or are we Prada? Oh, it looks like my sister has joined us this morning. Good morning, Caitlin. How are you? Uh, okay, so um, anyway, um, so let's continue. Um, now, what we want to optimize here, though, is not the distance, but rather the cost. And so we need to come up with a cost function for the whole thing. So the cost of laying um, the cables where we use X meters uh, is sort of the, the land part of it would be, well, it cost 50 bucks per meter for the land part. And 130 bucks a meter per uh, for per meter on the water part. Okay, so let's just label this. This is land cost per meter. This is water cost per meter. This is land distance, and this is the water. Okay, and then the thing that we want to deal with is the sum, the total cost of this whole operation, and so it's just those two things added together. And so what we want to do is to minimize C of X. Okay, now let's think about uh, what X can be here uh, before we get going. Okay, you guys still with me? I think my audio decided to die for a second. Um, okay, so um, what are the limits that we have on uh, x here? Well, in the last problem, x couldn't be negative. And it, let's go back up to our picture here and kind of interpret what it would mean for x to be negative. If we call x the distance between the this point here that's sort of in purple uh, and the perpendicular distance on the shoreline, I could have x somewhere over there, okay? Which, as we discussed, common sense wise, probably is going to be stupid. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll think of negative values of x in this situation meaning that I go to the right of that perpendicular point rather than to the left of the perpendicular point. And that would make, uh, as Willie is suggesting, the total land distance of the red piece of the figure would be greater than 5,000. Okay. Um, now, that's probably not going to be the optimum that we're looking for, but it is at least mathematically possible. Okay, so uh, in this case, we would say that x can be no bigger than 5,000 um, because otherwise we would be directly at the um, uh, at a and but there is no limit on x being negative that would just be to go as far to the right as possible we could even actually say and this maybe would be a better way to say it in general is that 
there really is no limit on x whatsoever because we could have another even stupider situation where we go some distance like we do this and then we come back towards the power plant this way okay which would also be rather silly um, but again mathematically that's still plausible so this would be the situation where X is um, say bigger than 5,000 um, and um, right okay so but anyway what well, let's return to the the sort of main issue here which is this dude we need to optimize that thing all right well how do we optimize a function let's take its derivative uh, all right wouldn't that flip the X uh, the that aspect of the cost function if X is greater than 5,000 um, yes so if X is greater than 5,000 we would have to um, uh, we would have to change the cost function because of this term here would become negative and that doesn't make sense um, and so uh, if X were greater than 5,000 what we would have to do is um, basically replace um, we would basically just have to switch the sign um, to and so I guess if you wanted to we could throw an absolute value in there and that would that would sort of take care of the problem um, but uh, yeah if X is less than 5,000 then we don't have to worry about the the absolute value um, and then of course the uh, this term here won't have any issues because it's a sum of squares so uh, thank you dr. Dunaway um, next time we'll do Lagrange multipliers and then that'll sort this out real quick won't it um, so okay um, so let's get busy with some derivative taking uh, let's ignore the absolute values in that cost function thing for now just because um, um, it uh, will make the calculus a little bit more uh, simple all right so the derivative is going to be in this case uh, minus 50 oops let's go back to the black pen the first term is easy minus 50 X um, and that's just because if you distribute all that stuff out you're gonna have 50 times 5,000 minus 50 times X take the derivative well 50 times 5,000 I don't care what that is because it's a constant so it's derivative is zero um, and then take uh, uh, minus 50x Oop. Uh, sorry that was terrible that would be minus 50x is derivative is minus 50 okay so got that straight um, excuse me and then the second part here that's going to be a little bit more fun uh, I would have um, plus one half times 130 times the stuff underneath the square root to the negative a half times 2x by the chain rule okay so let's clean this up a bit I would get minus 50 plus 130 over the square root of a thousand squared plus x squared okay so there's my derivative and optimal points occur when the derivative is equal to zero or at least they if they're going to occur they're going to occur at endpoints or places where the derivative is zero and we've already kind of established that this problem doesn't really have endpoints um, so we've got the derivative let's set it equal to zero and solve and the algebra will get a little bit nasty here but uh, say la vie so if we um, move the 50 over then we would get 50 equals 130 over the square root stuff and then let's cross multiply um, 
So it would be 130 over 50. And then let's square both sides. And then from this point, we need to um, just solve for x. So um, so let's see what we got. Um, OK, so x squared would be 13 fifths squared minus 1,000 squared. And then I'm going to square root that, but I'm a little bit worried because I feel like I'm about to take the square root of a negative. Um, uh, did I lose an x in the numerator? Um, oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Dunaway. No wonder. Okay. Um, yeah, I was, I was really worried about something there. Um, okay, so yeah, what I lost was the, um, the x right there from the, the chain rule. I just uh, dropped that off. Okay, and that will fix my problem. So let's uh, get rid of that. And so now we're back to here. Okay. <sighs> um, so, um, okay, so let me actually go back to, um, well, no, we're, we're, we're good there. Uh, let me go ahead and square both sides at this point. Um, rather than cross multiplying first. So um, this would give me 50, um, no, I'll go ahead and, um, well, okay, 50 squared equals 130 squared x squared over the, this, and then I can go ahead and cross multiply. All right, so I'd have, 50 squared times 1,000 squared plus 50 squared times x squared is 130 squared x squared. And then I want to get all the x squareds together. So I'd have 130 minus 50 would be 80. Or no, can't do that. Um, 130 squared minus 50 squared x squared is... 50 squared times 1,000 squared, and so x squared is 50 squared times 1,000 squared all over 130 squared minus 50 squared, and so x would be the square root of all that, which um, I can simplify a little bit. So this is a kind of where we have to be careful. The square root of 50 squared times 1,000 squared is 50 times 1,000. But the square root of the stuff in the denominator, uh, I can't um, simplify um, because of the minus sign there. Um, OK, so we've got our um, mathematical solution there. So let's actually switch back over to Mathematica and first off just say, well, what is that bloody number? All right, so what did we say it was? 50 times 1,000 divided by... Um, 130 squared minus 50 squared, and hey, we actually get uh, a nice number. Uh, it turns out what it was, uh, 1250 over 3, which is approximately 416 uh, point six repeating. Okay, so that's... Eh. Roughly half, um, or not halfway, um, that would be in, in the sketch of our picture, we had 5,000 meters this way, and we were coming like 400 there. So it's like a tenth of the distance, something like that, uh, would be kind of the, the situation that we had. All right, but, uh, so we found our critical point, and now what we want to do is sort of analyze, do we actually have a minimum here as opposed to uh, have we been stupid and accidentally maximized our cost? Um, so um, so let's go back up to the, um, the big function in um, green, which was our cost function. 
All right, so I'm going to program that into Mathematica uh, real quick. And then I'll, um, I'll show it to you. All right, so let me switch the source back to Mathematica. Okay, so there's my cost function. Oh, and I can't use C as a function, so let me call this, just say, cost of X. Um, the letter C is a protected function in Mathematica, so you can't use it as a variable um, because it already means something else. Um, okay, and so then let's plot our cost function. And let's plot it. Well, we've already said that x between 0 and 5,000 seems to make sense just from a common sense standpoint. Okay, and so we would get something like uh, that. And um, so if x is bigger than 5,000, would be the situation where we went past the power plant and as you would expect the cost just increases uh, quite substantially and uh, if we go with negative X's then we still get just gigantic costs okay so I'll go say between negative a thousand or five thousand and ten thousand to sort of belabor the point that um, if we think about our cost function, then um, there is no maximum, right? And that, in this kind of situation, actually ought to make sense that um, there is no limit to how much money you could spend on this problem. So you could go a million miles which would go around the earth a whole bunch of times, you could go a million miles uh, away from the power plant and just keep laying cable as much as you want and then finally cut over to the power plant and uh, spend as much money as you desire in that process. Now, clearly, that's not what you want to do in the real world. We want to minimize the cost here. And so let's... Um, Let's actually focus back in on the 0 to 5,000 case, which our common sense said was reasonable. And we do, in fact, have a minimum um, somewhere. Uh, you know, we, we said it should be at uh, about 400-ish, um, and that looks reasonable from our graph. Um, and how do we know that it's a minimum versus a maximum? Well, uh, if there's no limit on x's, then we can't necessarily just check our endpoints. So to verify that this is a minimum, what we need to do is look at the second derivative. Okay, so we found basically this. Oops. We found this value that the derivative was equal to 0 when x was this 1250 over 3 number. That was our 416 or whatever. Um, and looking at the graph, it's pretty clear that it's a minimum, but how do we know for certain it really is? Well, we need to look at the second derivative of that 1250 over 3, and we get here... Um, 432 over 4225. Okay, that number itself is not all that important. Um, what is important about the, the number? So the fact it's 432 over 4225, who cares? What is it about that number that I care about? Anybody from the peanut gallery? It is extremely close to zero. Yeah, it's small. It's like, 
you know, a tenth roughly. There's no variable. Yeah, those are both true, but that's not the droid I'm looking for. I need to like program in sound effects so I could have like the Jeopardy theme music playing and um, you know while you guys are writing out your answers or thinking about why this particular number what is it about 432 over 4225 I care about and what don't I care about okay so let me uh, throw a throw a hint. What are we trying to do? I'm trying to convince you guys that we have in fact found a minimum. And we looked at our second derivative and what pray tell might be interesting. Don't make Dr. Dunaway answer the question. Yeah, you heard your name, Dr. Dunaway. I'm trying to get them to argue why that the, what the fact that uh, I took the second derivative and plugged in 1250 over 3, which is our critical point, uh, why do I know that this has actually minimized my function? What is that, that value, cost double prime of uh, my critical value, or critical point rather, how does that show me that I in fact have a minimum? And that's what my, what the lads are kind of struggling with at this moment. Any brilliant ideas? Dr. Dunaway for the 360 no scope with the op. No, come on guys. You can do this. It's positive. Exactly. Thank you. So, um, a positive second derivative means that the function locally is concave up. And concave up functions go through minima if there are critical points. So, yeah, that's exactly the uh, what we needed here is that we had a positive second derivative at the special point in question. If we had had a negative second derivative at that point, that would have indicated that we had found a local max um, as opposed to a local min. Um, okay, so uh, let's just kind of recap the two problems that we were sort of looked at. One of them we sort of half looked at, uh, which is um, sometimes the constraints on the problem mean that you have a uh, a closed interval range for x's um, and uh, if that's the case then you have to examine the endpoints okay so the endpoints of that closed interval along with any places where the first derivative is zero um, and then in this the most recent problem the one with the offshore uh, cable laying um, it might be the case that there is no real limit on uh, what the variables can be. Um, there might be sort of a common sense limit. Uh, and in that case, we have to kind of use the fact that we understand what the second derivative tells us to verify that we have in fact found the minimum or maximum that we're looking for. Um, all right, and so as Dr. Dunaway is uh, pointing out here, um, we call these second-order conditions in econ, and they're super important when functions get screwy, which is entirely what happens. So this function was, you know, even with the square root, not all that horrendous. Um, and in some problems, the, uh, the functions can get quite complicated. And as you could expect, this being calc 1, uh, basically all of our problems are when push comes to shove, depend only on a single variable um, and uh, if you are dealing with genuinely multivariable functions 
and possibly with multiple constraints, then this stuff gets real complicated and you basically are doing uh, multivariable versions of everything that we're doing here. Um, those of you guys who, uh, who decide to go on to Math 112, you'll study that a little bit there. Um, or if you, um, I think set most of you guys or several of you guys are going to do uh, econ, and so next semester when you're in microeconomics, uh, you'll get this stuff in spades. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, so let's, um, I think we'll go ahead and uh, quit for the day. Um, but just to, to sort of recap, right, the optimization thing is first step is figure out what your constraint is, um, what are you trying to optimize, come up with equations for those things, um, and then start throwing calculus at it. I can't stress enough that drawing a picture to start of some sort is probably one of the best things that you can do. Pick, draw a picture, start labeling things, put an X here, a Y there, and so on, and um, then start to kind of throw some calculus at it. These problems usually will take uh, a fair bit of time um, because the calculus sometimes uh, gets a little nasty with the square roots and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, just take it slow and uh, step by step and you'll eventually get it. Uh, all right, so I'll go ahead and end the stream here. And uh, you guys can catch me on Discord if you have, um, have questions. Um, and we'll see you on Wednesday, if not sooner.